Hello there and welcome Virtual Space Hero community to another LinkedIn Live show today. And as I told you at the beginning of the year, I'm following up on all the requests from November and December. We are going to focus on and deep dive into the topic of remote work, virtual work, and as we now tend to call it, hybrid work. But about terminology, this is also something we're going to talk about with today's guest. Last week, you remember, we had an amazing conversation and it was very interactive with all of you out there talking about the different versions of remote that we have remote friendly, remote first, remote-ish, what is async first, why do we need to talk about that and be aware that there are differences. And today we are going to dive deeper into the topic of how we can navigate our company's journey, our organization's journey to a new way of working. And I'm thrilled that Again, I was very pleased that my invitation was accepted. Now connecting from Portland, Oregon, Elise Keith from Lucid Meetings. Hello, Elise. Hi there. Hi, good morning. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Elise, for taking your time. It is fantastic having you with us. You know that I told you in before when we when we were slightly talking about today's conversation that I'm a big fan of Lucid Meetings. So I'm not only following you on LinkedIn, but also going through all the valuable resources that you have on your web page and on, on your blog that you're also sharing so that you're sharing so with a lot of um with a lot of pleasure. Well, thank you very much for that. Elise, I have a question. You have been working in the field of how to create and design and facilitate engaging virtual meetings for how many years now? So we began working on the concept for our business 15 years ago, and uh, I think we're about 12 years old now. So wow. this is this is a this is an area of of much study, and it's it's great because uh, turns out meetings are loaded. There's so much to dive into there. There are so much variation. So, you know, it's a it's a lifelong pursuit. Absolutely. And I once heard, I think it was last year, one of my guests said, well, there is nothing worth, worse than a bad meeting. There's only a, the worst is the bad virtual meeting. Right. So how did you get into the, the, the meeting sphere in general? Why did you choose that area and why did you specialize on, on virtual meetings then? So we specialize on business meetings in general and virtual meetings, you know, happens to be the way that we're doing a lot of it right now. But um, we got into looking at meetings because we're interested in doing important work in the world, right? You want to, to make a difference. You want to have, be part of helping teams achieve their goals. And while meetings are just part of it, they tend to be the most powerful level you have when you're designing how to collaborate as a team. And when we began, we were working with a team that uh, supported international standards organizations. So these are these are groups that come together from all over the planet. They were meeting virtually, you know, at the turn of the century. So the virtual has been a thing forever. Um, and they're composed of people who are literally competing. Right. You've got got people from competing companies. You've got the public and the government and they all get together in a room and they decide this is going to be our standard for how this works across the planet. Right. So they essentially set global law, mm. which is really challenging. And they do it in meetings. Mm -hmm. And you would think, well, they must all have wonderful skills, right? They must have learned their sensitivity training and their crucial conversations and, you know, all of these things. And that it's not true at all. What happens is that they have well-structured processes that they use to run those conversations and then they get results. And so when we saw that, and then we would come back into the office and realize that as, a, as an agile development team, we were fighting over like what color to make the logo or you know how many spaces to put in front of our code lines. We we're like, okay, hold on a second. These people who literally don't, don't agree, they're not on the same team can make huge important decisions and we can't make little ones. But if we change our meetings, we can. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. How do you get to be a part of doing that for more teams? 
it sounds so powerful because also particularly in the past two years, we do know that it was really hard for many manager, many managers and organizations that I worked with to really get out of the meeting marathon to be able and be able to prepare and facilitate particularly virtual meetings properly. We're going to get into that in, in a bit. And uh, but let, let me ask you a question, a general question about the experience, the three biggest hurdles or challenges that organizations are facing when it comes to meetings? Well, uh, you mentioned one, and that's uh, when, especially as organizations that had been in the office went virtually all at once, um, when the things are changing rapidly, you need to talk more, right? There's just, you can't rely on things going as you're used to them going because everything's changed. So you need to figure out what you're doing. And they lacked other ways to do that other than meeting. Mm -hmm. And so they started to meet and they met and they met and they met. And then we have this craving for connection. I need to see the people. I need to understand what's going on. So they met, right? And then the meetings got longer and more complicated. So the, the huge challenge is that you're just in too many of them. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're in too many meetings, you can't do the fundamental things you need to do to make those meetings effective, right? Everybody says, oh, just, you know, just make them shorter. Oh, just have an agenda. Well, when are you supposed to write that agenda exactly if you're in meetings 40 hours a week, right? So it's, it's literally not possible to do effective meetings well if you have no time outside of meetings. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the other huge problem, you said three, um, is that- Yeah, I'm, I'm counting now. I'm, I'm counting. Yes. I'm brutal. Yes. Number one, yes. number two. <laughs> Um, and the other, the other huge challenge is that um, we take them for granted, right? So, uh, you know, as you move up the leadership change, the likelihood that you'll spend more of your day in meetings goes up. So managers, executives, they literally meet for a living. That is how they do their work. And yet fewer than 25% or so have ever had any training whatsoever in how to do that well. So if you have something that is your job, that you are not trained in the mechanics of how to do that job, are we shocked that it isn't working particularly well? What is your experience, Elise, if I may ask you, in terms of leadership programs? Because I've, if I'm just looking back at that, it's so true what you're saying, that in those um, typical leadership programs, it's all about the soft skills of leading, which is super important, of kind of empathy, cultural intelligence whatsoever. But very little of those programs really have those um, techniques on how to design and facilitate even a proper in-person meeting. That's right. Yeah, actually, we, we did um, some research and there are there are maybe five uh, college level courses mm -hmm. on uh, meeting effectiveness in the on the planet. Mm -hmm. Right. And usually it's a day or maybe maybe two. You know, sometimes if you're in a really fabulous MBA course in your business communications work, you'll get a week on how to structure and lead meetings. Now, um, as, as I and any of the, the people in our network who have found facilitation or design thinking or any of these other disciplines will tell you, um, you can spend your career figuring out the different ways to run effective meetings in different settings. So while I don't suggest that everybody should spend their career doing meeting education, um, I think they should spend more than a week if that's how they're going to spend their time. I yeah, totally it, agree. And at this point, I think I want to draw the attention to your blog because I do know that there is a fantastic blog about the different types of meetings there. So definitely check out lucidmeetings.com slash blog. Fantastic article about the different types of meetings. Elise, do you have a third challenge that you would like to, to sort of mention now? Yeah, so the fat the final challenge. So we've got we've got way too many meetings. We've got people leading them without training. Um and then uh, and then there's the, the final one, which combines both of those into the perfect storm of awfulness, which is what we call the, the meeting leader blind spot. So um, so I want you to think back to a meeting that you've really enjoyed. So what were some of the what were some of the characteristics of that meeting? I'm thinking particularly about one team. 
we we have a highly trusted environment all of us contribute to building up the agenda for example it's a four fee it's a female lead team company all of us contribute to building the agenda and we do discuss what we want to do until when we want to do it and who is going to do that and we have our way to work it out in a google doc to sort of distribute tasks and using trello so for me it's always pretty clear who is doing what until when whether we do it always okay that's another question clearly we're all busy but i think it is clear at the point when we are in the meeting or come out of the meeting Awesome. So the things you've identified there are the things that are, regardless of the type of the meeting, are critical for success in any meeting in terms of how you feel about it, which is you had some control or agency or at least understanding of what what the point was, right? How is this relevant to me? Um, what can I expect from this conversation? And then you had an opportunity to participate in creating a meaningful result. So you were engaged, you were, you were active in that, and you walked out with something. So in meetings, there is always one person in the room who walks in knowing what to expect, participates, and comes out with something. And mm -hmm. that is, it's, it's the leader, right? So you can, as a leader, put a meeting on your team's calendar that says sync up, which means nothing, mm -hmm. <laughs> means nothing. <laughs> you can put that on your team's calendar, walk in, have them report to you one at a time. And you knew what to expect. You got what you needed. Hey, I'm great at meetings. Yeah. So that it's not, it's not, um, it's not ill intended. It's a fundamental human bias. It's just a blind spot we all have. Um, when our expectations are met, we think we've done a good job. And since that is the case for meeting leaders, they, the people who are perpetuating the problem are the least likely to feel that it needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. Classic blind spot. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Elise. So I think we're already deep into the topic because we do see both of us, we just talked about it before, we do see a huge shift that is going on in organizations. And um, today we want to tackle the question about how can you navigate your company's changing way of working? And you have a lot of experience. So what is it that the car, the, the projects that you're currently working on, what is the main area or the topics that you are addressing with those companies? And then we go into a fantastic flow model of meetings that you're proposing. So the, um, the shifts that we are helping companies with at the moment are, are tackling the problem we just described, right? So we're in back-to-back -back meetings all of the time uh, to the point where uh, they're starting to lose people, right? You know, I mean, beyond the fact that you are losing performance gains and energy and morale, um, people quit. So that it's a huge business impacting problem. So helping people find different ways to restructure and pattern their meetings so that they can get the things they want, the connection, the, the progress, um, without all of the, the time in front of a camera um, is, is our main piece of work right now. Because companies, companies are really in a, in a tough spot, right? The, uh, the world around us is not stabilizing. And so there's this constant need to continue to shift how we work and that shift it, you know, as, as we were talking beforehand, it's, it's not really um, entirely new. So companies like, oh, we're doing the new hybrid work. Well, well, really, you know, uh, the, one of the things we see a leader say every once in a while is like, you know, we, we talked about it. We realized actually we've been meeting hybrid forever because half of our teams in Japan or you know Israel or Boston and and so you've always been a hybrid team so the question is just how do you make that when that extends to the entirety of your company as opposed mm -hmm. to just just pockets okay. mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so you're proposing um, a flow model. So I can also, I'm also happy to share that, uh, that from your webpage so that we can just have a close look at it. And then we dive into this flow mode because I really love that. So maybe uh, you want to uh, briefly explain 
how did you came up with the flow model? What, uh, what do you intend on um, with the flow model in general? So um, first off, a flow model, a meeting flow model is uh, a sequence of meetings that you use as part of a larger process to achieve the goals. So I'm sure there are many people uh, in this listening to this or who will watch this later who are change experts, right? So in every change management process, um, you will see the stages about, you know, uh, getting clear on what the change is meant to be and building awareness and getting buy-in and all of those things. Um, and this doesn't purport to replace any of that. It's really uh, what are the meetings specifically that you run as part of one of those processes and how do you run them? Mm -hmm. And that tends to be a, a, like basically a missing piece. So if you are going to, for example, uh, tell your teams that they're going to go run hybrid. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna do hybrid, which means some meetings are in the in face to face situations. Sometimes we are remote, as a team that all happens to live in the same geographic location. Well, how do you do that? Um, so there's a certain amount of training involved, and then there's a lot of what ha goes wrong in change processes. So, I mean, when in your work and with the teams that you've talked to, what are some of the things that people run into that go wrong? I think some of the basics of my clients where we always start is still technology. So I think most of my clients, at least, they don't have technology right yet. Uh, so we start analyzing technology as a basis to, to make hybrid meetings work, if we talk about hybrid meetings. And then, as you said also, as you have also in your blog post, and that's why it also resonated so much with me, is the train, the train aspect and the team working agreements. Because what I found with my clients, and many of them have not been at all working virtually. Some of them are very traditional Austrian organizations. And mm -hmm. They had not set up any sort of team agreement. And what we do know is the team agreements, also team meeting agreements, so how do we want to run our meetings, are essential. And so I think those are like the three challenges that I mostly worked on, um, setting up the team agreements, checking for technology, the basis, like 360 cameras, stuff like that, and training in uh, facilitation skills for virtual meetings. Perfect, right? So the, so the foundations of the, the fact that you even can make the hybrid work switch successful. Um, and then in the companies that, that we work with, uh, there's a whole nother le level of challenges as well. I mean, some, some that are really, really high level, like they say things like, hey, we're going to go hybrid. And it's not necessarily clear what that means. Does that mean that we have an office and you can come into it if you want to, or that you have to, or you know what? What are the boundaries, right? What are the what are the top level guidelines? So, so that lack of clarity is um, something that becomes a problem. And then shifting, right? It not only is it unclear, but then they change, mm -hmm. and if people feel like they're being whipped around. So how do you have conversations with your teams and set top level guidance that um, is clear, is appropriate, and that you can in fact adapt as the context changes? Mm. And right. this would be sort of also the starting meeting that you need to have, what you describe as set policy boundaries and timelines of that um, cha ongoing change. If you think about the clients that you work with, so I have the feeling, and also that's um, what Nicholas Bloom discussed in his, in his Harvard Business Review article, that uh, don't let employees choose their working from home days, but rather dictate them because that's better according to his data. And also the discussion three versus two or total freedom. What, it, what feeling do you have from your clients? What is the way of working, a new way of working that works well for most of your clients? I think um, trying to adapt any single set of guidelines across all industries is, you know, the height of arrogance. <laughs> I think, I think uh, different teams working in different uh, systems really need to be able to adapt to what's appropriate in their system. Mm. So I, I would not ha ha hazard a guess like that. Mm, okay. So, you know, I work with tech companies, I work with government, I work with, um, 
retail and their needs when, especially when you have organizations that are dealing with physical products or physical goods or, you know, hands-on care of humans, the, the needs of that environment are just radically different. Mm. It would be interesting to go back to Nicholas Bloom's um, article to check out his data source because sort of in his data, and he talks about 10,000 of questionnaires, that's what I uh, remember, mm -hmm. it certainly displays that that it's better to do sort of a three, two and uh, not make them choose. But anyways, fantastic. So we are talking about this first sort of meeting, this first check in your workflow model to set policies, boundaries, and timelines. Then you have the second step, which is about training and supporting team leaders. What is it that you are contributing or how do you work with your clients when you sort of come into this second sort of step of your of your workflow model? So yeah, in that step, um... You know, and and really the in terms of the flow model, the flow model is really about what companies need to be planning for as they're doing doing their changes, right? So, so you you have your decision that's made and the the boundaries around it, and then whatever those are, let's say you do in fact adopt the three two policy. So, what would you need to train on there? Um, certainly, in terms of the kinds of training that that my company provides, we we focus on how to do the meetings effectively. Mm -hmm. um, but, but there are a number of other things that come into play there. So as a, um, as an organization, as you are helping your people leaders make sense of that policy, you know, what does that mean in terms of office space? You know, if they're doing a three, two, are they all in at the same three and therefore you need a full office and then it's empty on two days? Is it staggered? How do they coordinate it? Where do they track it? What happens if people are sick? You know, what what are the specifics that they need to be able to to execute effectively with their teams? Mm. So that's what you have to train on so that when they are asking all of the questions, they have um, clarity on what is in and out of scope and where they have flexibility. And you know what's interesting now, remember one of his arguments from Nicholas Bloom was that if you let your employees choose their own working from home days, what do you think what days they would select? Monday and Friday. Exactly. And his <laughs> argument was, that's also what his data showed, like 80% of something would, would go for Monday and Fridays. And his argument was that then these days would be, em or these uh, in these days, the office would be empty and only the 20% who come in would be like, why would I come in if nobody else comes in? And then it sort of creates a negative spiral or sort of a negative, or a little bit of a negative spiral. That was his argumentation. I can understand that. I can understand that. But the um, there has to be, I, I think, a stronger reason to go into the office than to make the office look vibrant, right? Which means we need to rethink why we are in the office and how office looks like. Exactly. Exactly. What is that function? So the idea that across an entire company, you can say it's valuable for us all to be on, on Monday would assume that on something is happening on Monday that benefits from in-person interaction. Is that the day that you have your all hands conversation? Do you have a practice um, like, a, like Coda's bullpen where everybody is required to be in present at the same time so that all of those ad hoc conversations and, and you know the serendipity can take place, right? You concentrate your serendipity. Um, you know, if you're doing something like that, that has real presence value, sure. Otherwise, um, perhaps you ought to let teams figure out when the team needs to be together based on when they are most likely to create value themselves. Mm, absolutely. So if we think about an example, I was thinking, um, you know, of industries that you think ought to be able to to you know, either go all virtual or all need to be in person and um, uh, banking, investment banking in uh, real estate development, commercial banking. Now you would think that is a primarily knowledge work and most of the time they could just work from home. But a lot of what commercial bankers will do is they will then go do site visits, right? So they go and they check on their investments. You're building a high rise downtown, how's it going? 
Is the money we're lending you being well spent? Do you really need an extension? You know, all of these things. So there is an awful lot of in-person on-site activity. And often they will then come back together and they will look at like plans on boards. Like, and yes, you can do all of those things virtually, mm. but it's, it's not the same. There is a value to coming together. So if they are to concentrate their commercial activities, their investment activities, when they're dealing with models and things on a specific day, that makes sense for that team. And it makes sense for them to align it with when their clients expect them to visit. Mm. Not with some top level, like we all have to be here on Monday because the office looks good. You know, maybe yeah. Monday is the day for site visits. Mm, absolutely. Elise, in your flow model, there is step number four. So we had step number one, policies, boundaries, or step me maybe meeting number one. Then we talk about train and support, two and three uh, for team leaders. And then you talk about create team working agreements. So what is that all about? So working agreements are, um, are the missing element for most teams who are struggling. And a working agreement is where... Uh, you sit down and you talk about how we are going to work together and you list out all of the specifics. You know, what time of the day do we start? Um, where, how do we log our time? If we log our time, um, where do, where can I find the documentation? How do I report status? When are we meeting? All of those things and down to the level of like, when we meet, do I need to have my camera on, you know, or not? So mm -hmm. every piece of communication and collaboration protocol that you can make explicit saves you so many problems later. Mm -hmm. You know, what does it, so one of the cha great challenges for hybrid and remote teams, and I think everybody's, you know, talked to this one to death, but when you can't see someone sitting at the office next to you, are they working? Are they available? Um, if I need them, how, how do I, how do I ping them? Right. Those kinds of problems can be eradicated with a couple of simple agreements about, uh, how you signal the rest of your team that you are in fact working and, and free or not free. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and it's just, it's really minor stuff to do, but without the agreement, you have all kinds of bad assumptions and you waste an enormous amount of time. Yeah. And usually also the moment that you don't have those agreements, you're again, very synchronous, right? So the moment that you don't have agreements, how you want to communicate with each other, uh, it becomes very, by default, very often synchronous, synchronous uh, meetings or synchronous communication to say so. Yes, absolutely. So you don't, um, you know, we worked with a number of companies where their main method for communicating anything is PowerPoint, mm -hmm. right? PowerPoint shared in a meeting and the meetings balloon more and more people come because that's the only way you get the information. And that, uh, does not work. <laughs> you can't, it does not work when you're, when you're remote, it, it didn't really work when they were in person, but when they were in person, at least you could lean over and say, Hey, was there anything important in that call? And somebody mm -hmm. could be like, nah, and then you just go on your day. So that, that, that ability to like absorb from the atmosphere that, Ooh, that was a big one. I should have paid attention. <laughs> uh, that's, that's gone. So you have to go to all of them just in case they were the big one. Uh, and, and that's, it's, it's just totally ineffective. I've seen some teams, uh, try and record all of their meetings on video. Um, but I tell you what, if there's something you're going to binge, it's going to be Netflix, not like, you know, PowerPoint <laughs> presentations. <laughs> <laughs> totally. You're so right. And you know, it's so interesting. I just uh, listened, I think it was this week or last week to one of the, I think it was the HBR Ideacast with, about, about Jeff Bezos. I'm not glorifying Jeff Bezos or Amazon policy here to be very clear, but um, they were talking about him and what makes him so different in his way of innovating, working with failure, motivating whatsoever. And it's interesting because apparently there is an Amazon rule of no PowerPoint allowed at the meetings. And the next one, that's interesting. I'm not sure what you think about that. I never heard that before. Apparently at Amazon, they prepare not a meeting 
um, a meeting PowerPoint presentation where they go through and one person is speaking, but they sent a six pager memo five minutes before the meeting. They start reading through that memo when the meeting starts. So like the five, I don't know, the first five or 10 minutes, maybe they are reading 20. everybody. And first then 20, the depending on what it is. Sorry, again? First 20 minutes. Oh, the first 20, sorry, go, go ahead, Lily. So tell us about that. What do you think about that? How is that yeah. as, a, as, a, as a practice? Yeah, so there are a whole bunch of different ways you can share information um, for meetings and PowerPoint um, gets a bad rap, right? So the what, what I believe is that that practice at Amazon is actually really fabulous for a number of different types of meetings, but not all. So it's really great for um, the the way that they use it. So in uh, when they do like their work backwards uh, process where they're pitching a new product, right? They wanna get funding and a team together to build something brand new. Let's say they're inventing the Kindle for the first time or whatever their, their foray into VR is gonna be. Um, they will write that document, the, the whole vision and the FAQ from the customer's perspective and everybody will read it and then they discuss what they've read. And then it goes back uh, for revi revision if it doesn't pass muster to get funded. So in that situation, what you're doing is you're doing deep critical feedback and analysis on um, a potential decision with a significant business impact, right? Which means that if you walk in and people just spout opinions without being prepped, uh, you'll get a bad decision. Mm. If you send it all in advance, half of the pe people won't actually read it because remember the back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back meetings. So saving time at the beginning of the meeting means that everybody actually reads the same information. Mm -hmm. And it also allows the people who are writing it up, you know, those last five minutes before the call to get it right. <laughs> you know, we are, mm -hmm. meetings are a fabulous driver of getting work done because we procrastinate until we have to show proof that we've actually done the work. Mm -hmm. um, so, so in that way, it's a really great practice. Um, it doesn't work as well for things like training, client calls, you know, a number of places where PowerPoint is actually a really useful tool. Let's show some slides. Um, and for things like team meetings, something like a six page update on your status of what you've done last week is, is ludicrous. It's overkill. So there are ways to combine these processes. One of my favorite things for a team meeting is that you have established some way that you write down what you're doing in a shared collaborative way. Um, and you show up at the meeting and you update it in real time, in silence. Mm -hmm. And then say, okay, what, what here do we need to talk about? Where are the questions? Where are the, um, where are the things that are surprising you? What are you not seeing, right? So the updating and the reading are all happening in silence together in your meeting time. So all of that prep thing, prep time, you don't have to worry about, it's just done. Very powerful, very powerful. Thanks a lot for sharing that. And I was just uh, smiling at myself because I said like, well, they have a six page and they read it in the first five minutes or 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm like, they are super speed readers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, sometimes we'll do a, a very, there are all kinds of ways to take an idea like that and then vary it for your for your use case. One of the meetings we kind of we kind of slipped over in that flow that I think is worth coming back to, right? Because we talked about the team agreement we talked about, you know, okay, so the organization says, here's the rule um, and your guidelines. You train the teams to do it. The team leaders go work with their team and they create an agreement. How is our agreement about how we're going to work within this foundry going to look? And then life happens, right? Mm. So some of those things were great ideas and some of those things were not good ideas. So if you flip back up just a tiny bit to meeting three, I think. Meeting three is uh, one that I see people miss all the time. And that's the bit where peers, team leaders who are responsible for making this change across your workplace, come together and help each other. Hey everybody, um, it starts with basically, you know, a check-in and then what we call a moment of truth. So if it had been my mom, she would have called it the come to Jesus moment. Like, did you actually do the thing they told you to do? <laughs> but 
but a moment of truth, just a quick, yes, we did it. We didn't do it. And then what did you learn? Right. Uh, you know, somebody on my team shared this idea and it's been killer for us. You know, did you know that we already had a site-wide license to this piece of tech that you can use tomorrow and it's amazing, right? So the wins and they, they cross pollinate. And then the hard things, you know, they said we need to do this, but I have two people who have aging parents at home and they can't come in. Mm. How am I dealing with that? Right. Mm -hmm. So all of those, all of those bits where they circulate and they work through how to make this idea a reality that's functional and they support each other. That meeting um, is, is an incredibly powerful driver of effective change that uh, I haven't seen a lot of companies make space for. Mm, that would be sort of a peer learning activity or social learning, peer learning exchange. I think it could be also fantastic to have it embedded even like on an ongoing exchange practice. But anyways, you have an iterating workflow model here. So let's go into the other steps and then we come back maybe and see how often uh, is your experience that uh, that your companies or your organizations go through this model. <laughs> yeah. Pillar number five or meeting number five, step number five, would be the review and the, the, the revision or a necessary revision of the agreement. Is this something that you see happening every two months, every six months? How often do you have a feeling for how often do they go back and revise? Yeah, so essentially that's a retrospective, right? Which is a which is a practice where you look at something that you uh, you look at what your plan was, you look at what actually happened, uh, and then you decide based on what you've learned um, how you would change your plan. And this is something that teams need to do together on a pre agreed upon cadence, right? So one of the big challenges with change uh, beyond it not being clear. Uh, beyond not having the plan, which is why you have the team agreement, the team makes the plan, is that uh, it people don't buy in, right? They, they've, it's been Im imposed for some reason, they don't like the idea. So with a predefined revision date in mind, you can say, hey, we're gonna try this for two weeks and then we'll come back. Mm -hmm. And and with the, your first, first team agreement, I wouldn't let it go much longer than two weeks, right? We're gonna try it for two weeks. And then when you come back, that meeting, the 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 revision, the revise, the that retro doesn't have to be very long. It can be like 15, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and you fix anything that you can fix within your scope. And if there's something that isn't working, you write it down so that you can run it back up the chain. You document it. And you want to document it fast enough that the organization can shift its policies in a way that doesn't like isn't so late that you've lost half your team members because they've been told to do something that doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I would do it really quickly to begin with. And then once you, you're you working well, you know, it, uh, my team, our team has been working hybrid for, you know, 10 years. So we revisit our working team agreements every six months mm -hmm. just okay. to make sure mm -hmm. that they're okay. Fantastic. Thanks a lot for this um, sort of also personal experience um, on the topic, uh, Elise. And then we have a last meeting that sort of contributes or finalizes the first or maybe uh, the last cycle of this workflow model, which is about harvesting best practices and recommending changes. So what is this meeting all about? So the um, the last one in the cycle is is how do you surface up? You've got the team leaders that are coming together in these mentorship meetings, right? These peer learning circles, and they're they're finding things that um, work or that don't work or that need to change. And you've got the teams themselves that are finding things that work or don't work and need to change. The team leaders, your people leaders, have that information. People leaders are often not the decision makers for the large policies. So how do you get that information from the people leaders to the policy setters? That's mm -hmm. what this meeting is about. And it's a, basically a council. So people come up and they say, here are things that we would recommend we change in the policies and here's why. And decision makers and advisors ask questions. You know, why is this? What are you seeing? What's going on? And all of that information, that intelligence about what really works on the ground for your company gets fed back up into the larger policy. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I recommend with a larger policy that also has an expiration date, right? We're going to try this hybrid thing for three months unless something external comes in and we need to change more quickly. You know, and if that happens, we'll let you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Totally agree, Elise. And if you just think back, I'm not sure if there is a if there is a sort of a number that you could tell us. But how often because you're, you're stating that this workflow model, you can go through this meetings. Uh, until sort of you say repeat the cycle as many times as needed to achieve your organization's better way of working so that the clients you work with, how often do you have the feeling they go through this workflow through these meetings? So it depends on the size of the client, right? So if you're dealing with a, a company that's like 200 or fewer, right, they can go through that entire cycle rather quickly. Um, and a quarterly basis, a quarterly cadence for reviewing policies makes makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you don't want to mo- change so fast that people are getting whiplash and they can't. There's no predictability <laughs> to how and how they'll leave, live their lives. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, the the uh, macro environment is so dynamic. You know, you, ha- half the time we're being mandated where we can or cannot be uh, that you do have to adapt to that. Larger companies take more time, right? You have you have more levels to work through, and you have more local circumstances to deal with. Mm, fantastic, but it gives sort of an indication, better understanding on how much time that could take. Elise, I think we went through a very complex, amazing workflow meeting model that you set up that you describe in detail. And so just again, if you go, all listeners out there, loseitmeetings.com, if you go to the blog, and we will also make sure to to post the link as I already did here in the comment section, you find the blog article to sort of read through it again after this conversation happened and definitely don't miss out to follow Elise Keith and Lucid Meetings on LinkedIn or on any other social media channels that you find them on. And Elise, it was really a tremendous pleasure. And again, I think a big thank you from all virtual facilitators out there because Lucid Meetings, the blog and you are a source of inspiration and knowledge that is really invaluable. Thank you so much for sharing everything. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thanks a lot, and goodbye to uh, to Portland again. But I uh, see in the in the in the virtual lobby back doors, I prepared a virtual cocktail, so I'm there in a minute. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye. So with this, we are again at the end of another amazing virtual space here on LinkedIn Live. Thank you so much for also contributing with your questions beforehand and during the session. It was fantastic. And don't miss out to check out virtualspacehero.com because we do have on the web page our upcoming guest lineup. And more importantly today, just looking here again at Lucid Meetings, Those of you who are looking for an in-depth course and training program about how you can free your team from unproductive meetings, don't miss out to check the webpage from lucidmeetings.com. And a cohort, a group is starting the 22nd of February. I just started 23rd and then again the 22nd of March. So be fast to get your uh, seat on these training courses. And with that, check out our webpage as well. As I said, line up until the end of March is already online or the end of April already. Yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Next week, we're going to talk about team challenges in the high working context about how to manage perceptions of bias and creating a culture of fairness. So I hope to see you there. Thank you very much for joining us and also for contributing with your questions and suggestions. Don't forget to become a virtual space hero. Bye.